with Liberty Me. I'm Kyle Platt, uh, here with Dr. Robert Murphy. Uh, he is author of uh, a lot of text, fantastic stuff. Uh, you know, uh, Chaos Theory is fantastic. Um, you know, all the economic stuff. He is a fellow at the um, Ludwig von Mises Institute, and he's written a Liberty Guide for Liberty Me, which is uh, how to become a independent intellectual. I've wanted to talk to you forever, Bob, and it's, it's an absolute pleasure, so thanks so much for being on. Well, thanks for having me. I'm really excited about what you guys are doing over there. I appreciate it. I'm gl glad to uh, have your input on it. Uh, and speaking of your input, the name of your Liberty Guide on the site is How to Become an Independent Intellectual. So what does that entail? Is it, does it entail separating yourself from the academy? I mean, even though you, you have a, a great education and you have, uh, you've obviously studied economics for quite some time based on your knowledge, uh, you know, what, what entails becoming an independent intellectual? Well, I'm an economist, and so that means I'm not going to give you a straight answer. I'll just try <laughs> to give the merits of, of both sides of the way to answer that. Uh, I think the, the route I took in the guide was to just explain the, the trade-offs involved and to say, like, it, so in my case, I could not do the kind of consulting work that I do if I didn't have the three magic letters of PhD after my name, just because the, the groups I work for, like, if there's going to be a research report coming out, for them to be taken seriously, like, in policy circles, and so for their donors to think it's a big deal, it helps to say, oh, this guy, you know, so even... You know, certainly with the internet, especially somebody could be very knowledgeable, and I know plenty of people that I think are really good economists, even though they didn't get a PhD from somewhere in economics. But nonetheless, depending on what exactly you want to do to earn your income, you may need to get a PhD, especially if you want to have a fallback position of being able to teach at the college level. Then you clearly have to get a PhD. Um, but the downside is the opportunity cost and it's, it's it doesn't cost you that much out of pocket because most programs you go through you're not paying tuition you're going to have somebody dealing with that but it's that you're you're that far behind and it's not just in terms of the abstract giving up years of your life what you need to think is what if i were working somewhere earning valuable experience for five six seven years how long is it going to be that that's the position you know so it's not just that you're treading water it's that you're losing out relative to all the experience you could be getting so you know, the guy I, I walk through and just give people examples and, and how to analyze the situation and what is it they want to do. I kind of think going forward, having a, a PhD is going to be less and less relevant unless you really want to be teaching at a formal school or, you know, publishing peer reviewed articles. I, th I think we already see that. You know, it seems like there are, there are countless examples of individuals that get postgraduate degrees and then apply for jobs, but they don't have experience. That's what, that's what people want. Right, and a, and a lot of the sorts of specific applications that I talk about in the guide and what I think we can see unfolding before our eyes is that with the internet, people are able to figure out different pockets of potential customers all over planet Earth who will you know, value the services these people can provide. And so you know, over time, the fact that you have a, a particular degree, that's going to be less and less of a signal to those potential customers. And so I think it's going to be really easy going forward for people to figure out ways to support themselves and to earn a nice income without having gone through that formal process. Is the primary benefit of a degree just signaling, just pointing out to others that you have the education rather than the, the education itself? Uh, I mean, there's a whole empirical literature on that, and I haven't looked into it. I'm, I mean, I, Brian Kaplan, I know, has been writing on that and blogging about it. Uh, I, I, I do not go down the path of of being real cynical and saying, oh no, the only thing you get at college is you know knowing how to do a keg stand and then getting the the signal after your name. That's that's not where I take. I think that there is something you get from it, but it's it's hard to quantify. Like for me, the benefit of having gone to NYU and getting the PhD there is beyond just learning like the specific Keynesian models in ways that I would not have been able to had I gone somewhere else, let alone if I had never gone to a graduate program. But just being around people that were that intelligent and that, you know, people, there's something to be said to, to go to a place where people just go to the library and work on home problem sets six days a week for 10 hours a day. I mean, I had never been, a, I was always the best student by far growing up and I had never needed to work that hard. And NYU really showed me that, no, I, I need to apply myself. And so I saw this is what I can achieve if I'm not just, 
you know, intuitive and sharp and know stuff because I'm smart, intelligent, but also what if I really worked hard at this, like it was a full-time job, what could I do? And so that's, it was kind of like boot camp for me in that respect. So I would not have been able to do that had I just, you know, done it myself on the internet. Sure. And I think there's something futile about the idea of changing the academy from the outside. Um, I, there's a number of people that imagine that if we just ignore the kind of thought coming out of universities today, that it will go away. And in fact, I believe, and I don't know if you agree with this, we'll see, uh, that the only way to really change the thought in the academy is within the academy. You know, if you want to be a professor, you know, go to school, get the degree, get in there and get your ideas out there. Because to be honest with you, you know, there are tons of Marxist professors. There are tons of professors that are uh, very negative toward ideas of liberty, but uh, it generally doesn't work as a huge obstruction for people who do good work to get into the academy. I feel like for the most part, if you do good work, you can do well. Yeah, I think that's that's certainly true. I mean, there, the analogy I like to use, and I'm probably not the first one to do it, is like if you were uh, some, a black person in the United States like in the 1960s, there would certainly be institutional barriers against you, you know, depending on if you want to go in the workforce or whatever. But just dwelling on them and say, oh, I don't stand a chance. The society is really racist. I'm just mad and miserable at the world. That's that's not productive. That's not healthy emotionally. And so what you got to do is, OK, if you need to be twice as good a worker as the white guy in order to get promoted, well, then be twice as good of a worker. And so I think it's the same kind of thing for Austro-Libertarians in academia. Yeah, they it's going to be harder for them to get papers published from with their perspective that the referees are going to be really anal and nitpicky. So then, OK, go ahead and, and do all the stuff they say and go provide the citations, make it just, you know, that they can't possibly disagree with you or publish in lower ranked journals than what other people would be able to do with comparable research. So um, I, I agree with all that, that you can still make it and that you shouldn't. Let me put it to you like this. It has certainly changed even within my brief span that when I was an undergrad and first getting into NYU, barely anybody even knew what Austrian economics was. And then with the crash and with, you know, Ron Paul's campaigns and so on, lots of people now know what it means. They, they still don't think it's true. They think it might make fun of it, but at least they know what it is. Whereas when I was first coming up through the ranks, no one even knew what it was. And so it's, it's not the handicap in terms of if you want an academic career that it might have been in the past. And it, it, I mean, everyone's got to, there's different benefits from everybody doing various things. So it really helps that guys like Ben Powell and Ed Stringham are out there, you know, publishing very prestigious looking books on anarcho capitalism with historical examples and so on that it helps me and my more popular outreach efforts to be able to point to that stuff so that other policy wonks don't think I'm a freak because they can be like, well, no, actually, uh, you know, Cambridge University Press published such and such or whatever. And so it, it, it helps to have that thing. But I also think it would be wrong if everybody who's 25 right now and interested in liberty thought, oh, I should therefore try to become a college professor. I think that would be a waste of our limited resources. Oh, God. Well, I mean, the, the, the market for uh, postgraduate degrees is, is already so flooded. Yeah, that's, a, that's maybe the worst idea I've ever heard. But <laughs> so I could come up with some worse ones if you wanted. But, uh... <laughs> what do you think is the biggest misunderstanding about Austrian economics? Um, okay, I guess it depends which groups you, you have in mind. Uh, I guess with, the, with general economists, I think the biggest misconception is they think that it's um, just like libertarians who dress up their preconceptions with some you know, quick little intellectual uh, vocabulary and that it's not a serious, rigorous school of thought. And I guess related to that, even among like libertarians, I think the misconception is they think, oh, I don't need to go study price theory. I already know the government sucks and I already know minimum wage laws are evil. And so I don't need to go study that kind of stuff. Or I, I hate the Fed anyway because it's a bunch of bankers ripping me off. So why would I need to go study, you know, Mises or Hayek? They'll, they'll, they use really big words and that's boring. And so it, it's kind of related that people don't realize, no, there is this independent, objective, scientific body of thought that we call the Austrian School of Economics. And it alarms me how few really active liberty-minded people have actually studied that in any depth. Like, 
you know, I understand people not reading Human Action. That's a hard book to read, but a lot of people haven't even read Man, Economy, and State, which really you ought to read large portions of if you want to call yourself a really knowledgeable libertarian in today's world. Sure. Uh, what do you think about the claim that Austrian economics is anti-empiricism? Well, yeah, I mean, that was another one that I was, that, that was the runner-up in my mind when you asked it. That was my first thought, but I, I pulled back on that. Yeah, it's, and that one's more under, so I, th I think that that is a myth to say that Austrians, you know, don't care about the data, they just bury their heads in the sand, because the, the way that most people, unfortunately, think about science and so on, like, that's just, that means it's unscientific by definition. They don't realize that the Austrian position is that no you guys are being unscientific if you think the way to conduct economics is to go, you know, use regression analysis or what have you, and that that's the way you discover economic truth. Um, and so I, so, so yes, that, that is a very big misconception, but I mean, it's kind of related. It's, it's a particular manifestation of the more general thing that I was saying is they, a lot of people believe that, the, oh, you become a, you're a libertarian for you hate the government first, and then you latch on to Austrian economics because it spits out the conclusions you like. I think that's what a lot of people believe happens. Sure. And, uh, you know, I, I think one of, an, another one of the misconceptions about Austrian economics is about the method itself. Um, you know, there are Austrian economists like Hayek that believe in uh, guaranteed basic income and social safety nets. I mean, I, I think those are separate from Austrian economics, but some people think that it needs to be a kind of... Uh, a purity test, whereas, you know, you have to be this kind of libertarian, this kind of Austrian economist. Whereas, you know, it's, it's basically just an economic method and everything else is um, auxiliary. Right, yeah, so you raise a bunch of good things. So, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that Mises was instrumental in forming the, the center that's, you know, studied business cycle research, right? And so it, it's not that Mises had some, you know, aversion to looking at numbers or something, especially when it comes to understanding the business cycle. And, uh, and you're right. A point, a simple point that Walter Block makes often is to say, hey, libertarian political theory is distinct from Austrian economics. And so in principle, you could be an Austrian economist and also be a communist. You know, you could say, yes, I understand intellectually that, uh, to have a central bank that intervenes and lowers interest rates causes the boom bust cycle. And you know what? I like causing the boom bust cycle because it, you know, strengthens the government or whatever, or, you know, makes screws over the capitalist or whatever. And so that's why I'm for it. Right. So Austrian economics cannot give policy prescriptions. If you were just a, a misanthrope and you hated people, you might therefore use your knowledge of Austrian economics to recommend certain government policies that lead to starvation. Okay. So, you know, just like, if you if you wanted to kill a bunch of people and you were some monster, morally you would need to know physics and chemistry and biology. You know, it's not that you would use a different physics or chemistry to make something to hurt people. You would need to know how the world works. So it's the same thing with economic science. That strictly speaking, Austrian economics is an objective, uh, value-free analysis of just how does the economy work. Thanks so much for talking with us, Bob. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and I look forward to doing it in the future. Thanks for having me.